So welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Monsef Shiwa. I'm with Polytechnic uh, Montreal in Canada, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all today for this uh, inaugural event uh, that we uh, call the IFAC Industry Connect, and I will act as a moderator for um, this event. So today's event will be considered for becoming a recurrent event in the future. We are actually targeting a meeting every second month. And this, of course, uh, will depend on the feedback that we will get from you. And of course, your willingness uh, to attend to more of such events. So let me start uh, by some organizational aspect first. So all the non-presenter participants will be muted and the video will be disabled. Uh, to ask your questions or to offer a comment, uh, please use the Q&A button. And then we will respond uh, to some of your questions uh, during the last part of the webinar. So today's round table will discuss on how to identify needs and opportunities to shape the control research impact on technology. And actually the discussion of today was triggered by the publication uh, earlier this year of a paper entitled The Impact of Control Research on Industrial Innovation. What, uh, what would it take to make it happen in the IFAC Control Engineering uh, Practice Journal by two of our uh, panelists, uh, Silvia Mastelloni and Alex van Delft. So a uh, quick introduction, as you can see here, Sylvia is with the University of uh, Applied Science uh, of Northwestern uh, Switzerland. Uh, Sylvia has uh, a long experience uh, in industrial research because she actually was with ABB Corporate Research in Switzerland. And she worked a lot on the development and uh, technology transfer of uh, power systems. Next, we have Alex van Delft, uh, who have a long career of uh, corporate manager process control for Royal DSM, and who is now independent consultant. Uh, he has also a lot of experience uh, in uh, executive boards and also in um, uh, or, um, governmental uh, organization and uh, on how to bridge the gap between industry and academia. The three other participants in our uh, panel discussion are uh, Finn Ankersen, uh, who is a senior guidance navigation and control uh, systems uh, specialist at the European uh, Space Agency, ESA, and he has a lot of uh, experience in the deployment of advanced control systems and he was also involved in uh, around eight flown space missions. Uh, next, we have Hans Alto. Uh, Hans Alto is with uh, Neste Engineering Solution. Also a long career, a long experience, 35 years uh, of experience in process control and real-time optimization. Uh, noticeably, he received the Technology Award of Pipeline Simulation Interest Group in 2016. Uh, for developing uh, an MPC, model predictive control based concept uh, for the complex task of uh, dynamic real optimization of natural uh, gas pipeline networks. And finally, last but not least, uh, we have Ivan Marius with us today. So most of you, I guess, know uh, Ivan uh, from his uh, background in academia. But as you may also know, he's now the director of uh, the center for Applied Research and the Partner in Global Business Service in IBM Australia, New Zealand. Uh, uh, even mentioned to me that he, he thinks his main achievement in the space of taking control into industry scale is prob probably a suit of patents uh, that deals with sensor models and control and that is now being commercialized uh, by a company uh, to maximize the efficiency, the productivity and sustainability of agricultural water. So as you can see here, we have a large uh, panel of application from process control to agriculture to power systems. Uh, so therefore, I hope uh, we can cover uh, all the uh, potential application of uh, control uh, systems. 
so I think uh, we can now uh, start with uh, a few minutes uh, that every panelist will spend on presenting to us his uh, opinion and his point of view on how to solve this extraordinarily complex problem on how to transfer uh, controlled uh, research into the industry. So I will start uh, by inviting the two authors, if I can find their slides. Thank you, Monte. Just one correction on my side will be power conversion control. Sorry. My yes. part. It's okay. So, I, Sylvia, whenever you want, you can start. Thank you, Monsef. We can also go to the next slide. So, welcome everyone. Um, and we would like to start the discussion with two quotes, actually, two inspirational quotes, which I personally believe uh, summarize the key point in which uh, academia and uh, industry can work together in order to bring innovation. So, the first one comes from Pralat, the corporate social strategist. He stated, I believe most successful company will be the one with the skill, attitude, and capability to collaborate. So strong emphasis on collaboration. And the second quote comes from Ariri in his uh, celebrated book, Sapiens, where he states that capability of abstraction, communication, and cooperation led to humanity large achievement. So what does this mean for us in this context is that collaboration with, with the involved party in driving innovation plays a pivotal role. And uh, we go to the next slide where we present shortly with one picture that it's worth more than a thousand words. What is the, the paper about? So the paper was the impact of control research on industrial innovation. And the fundamental question was what, what would it take to make it happen? Hmm? How can we make this happen? Uh, as Monsef mentioned, was published in the control engineering practice and uh, many of you collaborate to this paper uh, through, the, through the survey that was run in the last two years by the IFAC Industry Committee. So the key, uh, the key contribution and message is the proposal of an innovation uh, platform, an innovation cycle, an innovation strategy, in which we see this, these two key players. On one hand, the industry with the customer requirement specification, with specific product or process or services. And on the other hand, we see the research institution, right? And what the cycle does is pretty much states that in order to be able to, um, to innovate, in order to be able to have a valuable and uh, sustainable innovation, this cycle has to be somehow connected and activated. So first part of the cycle is about the market-driven innovation in which we have the customer requirements or customer wish, and then they eventually be translated into technical requirement specification, system requirement, engineering requirement, and finally to a research agenda. And one example of this was actually proposed in the paper through the, uh, through the survey. So through a survey, we could gather a lot of uh, input from different industrial representatives in different sector and change and elaborate this requirement in order to be able to come up with a set of problems, of control problems and say, hey, look, those are the problems you have to look at if you want to have an impact in an industrial sector. So those are the one uh, key element that then will enable the next generation of product, process, or service. So this goes from the first part. The second part from, uh, let's say, from idea to product is, of course, also an even more arduous journey because an idea, before it ends up in a product, it has to evolve. It has to evolve, it has to change, it has to be elaborated, and there are a lot of hard along the way. So the key call of the paper is really look at the big picture, look at the big frame, look at the financial aspect of an idea, look at the implementation aspect of an idea. So look at the full cycle, make sure you can communicate with your left and right, and make sure that you can identify where are the points in which the cycle gets stuck. So where are the points that are a bottleneck for this innovation cycle? and put time and resources to address those deadlocks. Um, this is the key message that we had in the paper. In the next slide, there is my personal view that I would like to offer in this, uh, in this panel. 
And is that the way I see there is, of course, one common mission, right? There is, there is a common vision. I mean, we all agree with that. We all want the same thing. We all want to innovate. We all want to advance science and technology. I mean, this is part of our genes in general, and this is part of, uh, of eager researchers. There are gaps, however, and I mean, the gaps are, of course, mostly in the intermediate goal, the way I see it, right? That are the intermediate KPI that each of the institution has. So there can be like number of publication on one hand and on the other hand, time to market. And as a consequence, this has also a different value in terms of time scale, right? Then the two institutions operate fundamentally at two different time scales. Another aspect that is a limiting factor is the required specialized knowledge. And here there is a small cartoon that I adapted to, to our case, um, is that pretty much there are three key players the way I see, right? There is the researcher, there is the engineering aspect of making this idea, this solution viable, and there is the financial aspect. And if we all speak different language, it's gonna be impossible to, to move the, the boat forward. So none of us should shy away about, yes, being a specialist in one part, but also learning the language of the other two, learning and understanding the key problematic and limitation of the other two. This will also help us to do our job uh, better in a, in a direction of uh, impact for uh, industrial innovation. Now, way in which the gap could be uh, possibly reduced, let's say, is of course by aligning the intermediate goals of each one of the institutions. So making sure we have intermediate KPIs that are more aligned besides the final vision of innovation. And this could be done by aiming at more technology driven paper, for example. I mean, publications that are more close, that are closer to technology. And on the other hand, valuing innovation in, uh, in the performance that fundamental research can bring. This will of course require allocating time and resources, right? Will require for industry to allocate some time to be able to slow down to really develop solutions that are long-term sustainable. Um, another part is that, I mean, we have to allocate resources for this, we have to allocate time for this, we have to allocate money for this. And as I said, in terms of what the people can do, we should be able to be all a bit mediator. So we should be able to communicate with the others to create a set of extended knowledge that help us integrate what we already uh, know because of our specialization. Thank you, Montef. This is my message. I think next one from Alec. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Sylvia, for explaining the paper in an excellent uh, way. And coming back to the picture that Sylvia was showing, uh, it's a process picture. It's a process with uh, two steps uh, from research to application and from application and industry back to uh, uh, applied or fundamental research. And if you want to control a process, you need to understand the process. Eh? That's basically the, the way, that's our discipline. And to understand the process and to really achieve sustainable results in better controlling a process, there are three aspects uh, necessary to, uh, to tackle. Eh? That's the people aspect, the processes aspect, and the tools and system aspect. And for each of these aspects, I have a couple of recommendations and calls to actions uh, for all of you because uh, they all need to be in balance in order to achieve really a behavioral change on both sides, academia and industry, and to achieve sustainable uh, results. And for the people aspect, I believe we need more specific knowledge brokerage events. Have uh, really people from industry together with people from academia come together and share their new insights, but also their day-to-day -day, uh, problems. As a matter of fact, this week, uh, such an event is going on in, uh, in Germany, uh, the Archema Online, which is an excellent example of what good looks like, I believe. Another way of uh, the people aspect, another aspect is that uh, we need to take more into account into automatic control, the real people aspect in implementing these things. So how is an operator looking at a new algorithm? How can he really uh, be helped with the technology rather than that's uh, replacing him. That's an important aspect that I felt during my 30 plus career in process industry was always lacking. In terms of processes of cooperation, I believe that the formation of uh, consortia will help us enormously to, uh, to really uh, bridge uh, the gap. And I believe there's a role for IFAC to actively coordinate and connect uh, 
in these uh, matters. And there are examples of uh, successful consortia in Europe, in Europe, in Germany, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, where we can learn from and we can translate that to our industry sector or our region. And we must better share success stories of cooperation and how to handle your ecosystem of suppliers, academia, and end users. And in terms of tools and systems, uh, I believe that we need more focus on the implementation aspects and really link up with yeah, what kind of buzzwords also in the industry, yeah, digitalization, industry 4.0, operational excellence, need to position ourselves as automatic control much better in these uh, buzzwords and also in these technologies. So team up also with your tools and systems. And in the end, yeah, technology is not a goal in itself. It's only valuable either in money or in sustainability targets when it's applied. And for that matter, we need collaboration. And we hoped that we could uh, trigger the collaboration with this paper as a first step. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, Alex. Uh, let's now have a look at uh, another type of industry. Sorry. Um, Jim and Jim tell us about his experience in the aerospace service. Sorry, I'm going to stop sharing for some reason. You know if you can see the screen. Okay, you can go to the next slide. So I'm going to uh, try to give uh, two quick examples here of, uh, I would say, a successful mission which has been making use of uh, academic, academia knowledge uh, transferred to industry and has been successfully closing the gap in those. One is the uh, well-known Rosetta mission that landed uh, a probe on, uh, on a comet uh, in 2014-2015. And it's a small spacecraft with a very, very large flexible solar panels. And it was very clear to us from the beginning that you would not be able to do that with classical uh, uh, single input, single output control. Uh, and uh, we were pushing via studies to try to look into uh, robust control techniques. And uh, we succeeded to do the first H-Infinity uh, controller in the uh, agency. Uh, uh, with uh, the cooperation with academia. Then uh, during the mission, uh, there has been about 10 years and some failures uh, had occurred uh, on some hardware. And then uh, we basically needed to uh, retune the controller, which we were doing by adding a Delta controller on top of the existing one done by industry. And uh, this time without asking for it, they were applying directly structured of H-Infinity uh, techniques uh, in order to do that, which uh, has in the meantime been industrialized uh, via a, a collaboration between the agency and academia and industry, which uh, clearly shows that uh, it is possible to uh, bridge a gap. I can go to the next slide. And if you can make it to fit uh, on the, the page, it would be great. A little bit higher up, please. No. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Um, then another example is a very demanding mission to, to uh, as a precursor uh, thing uh, of uh, the gravity wave uh, mission, which has to uh, measure very accurately. So basically, in principle, uh, you see on the bottom drawing, you see uh, basically a spacecraft, and inside you see two proof masses, which are free floating, and, and they have to be controlled uh, uh, to uh, uh, lesser acceleration levels than 10 to minus 15. 
uh, which is um, uh, quite uh, precise. It's a very strongly coupled system, uh, which again would not be solved uh, with uh, classical uh, techniques. This is uh, done back uh, about 10, 12 years ago when uh, robust control tools were not uh, as robust as they are today. So again, we had a collaboration with academia and we needed to stick our fingers into some of the algorithms in order to handle uh, uncertainty levels of uh, like a delta block of 473 real uh, parameter uncertainties, which is uh, normally the tools would crash with that. But uh, again, with the collaboration of that, it was uh, achieved uh, successfully. And so the bottom right curve uh, shows uh, the requirements uh, and what was actually achieved uh, was about three times, three orders of magnitude better than what was needed. And the red curve is actually at the same level as what has to be measured on a real mission. This was just a proof of concept uh, mission. And, and this we can, to a large extent, uh, together with the uh, hardware technology, we can thank to the uh, control uh, applied in this one. So again, a successful mission, which uh, we would not have been able to do without the cooperation uh, between the two entities. And that, that closes my two examples of a uh, successful uh, trying to close the gap between uh, academia and uh, industry. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Finn, uh, for this uh, nice example. Let's now hear uh, from Hans. Problem with Hans slides for some reason. Yep. Okay, I cannot uh, open Hans slides, so let's start with Eden first. In the meantime, I'll try to sort it out. So, so better luck with. Slides. Excuse me, if you, Monsef, if, if you can't open the slides, I can talk without them, if needed. Uh, that's okay. Let's let's uh, let's proceed. Leave them first, and then I'll come back to you. That's okay. So that even. Yeah, thank you, Monsef. If you can go straight to my only slide, I only have one slide. So I, I felt that um, I, instead of talking about an example, I might just talk about what I have experienced as being the gap. And there is indeed a gap. And I feel that the gap is due to the very different cultures that our organizations, be it in industry, be it in academe, actually have developed over time. And it, it's a consequence of are the rewards that we use, the even the language we use, the time scale on which we work, and also the scale at which we work. You saw a nice example of that, I mean the Delta example with Finn just a minute ago. But at the bottom line, I think it's the main difference is really the cultures of the organizations that we are dealing with. And and the way we, we can overcome this, this gap, heard of it for me, is to find win-win uh, projects. So these projects that really have this interface between an industrial win and an, and an academic win. And, and really just the, the fact that we have different cultures in itself is already a win-win situation because we know that uh, if we bring diversity together to a solution that we have better ways of solving the problem. And diversity always enriches and there are lots of studies done in, in management if you have diverse teams coming together, they, when they are well managed, I must say, not when they are badly managed, when they are well managed, they actually achieve a lot better than when the monoculture uh, teams are coming together. 
in order to make that really work, you need champions in my mind. And I would like to, to argue for three levels of champions. The champions I mean are people that can remove the obstacles. And given that we have different cultures, there will be obstacles on both sides of the, the bridge. And, and people will have to be willing to stick their neck out and, and, and argue for the projects to continue or to, to work well and to remove any obstacle that is there. And, and one of the best advice I've been ever given in this space is you make sure that there are no surprises on either side. So open communication channels, regular communication channels, decent reporting is extremely important. And I would like to argue for three levels in order for, to get longevity. Uh, you can work at the project level, you should work also at the management level, and if you really want a long-term uh, collaboration, you also need to work at strategy level. And uh, those three levels have to work on a regular basis, being well informed and knowing what's going on. So that if a project manager disappears, someone else knows about the project and can pick up, pick up the broken pieces or pick up the places where things left off and continue with it. And if you can also do that at board level, at the strategic level of the company and in the university, that makes it also much more easier to work with. So that's what I would say is cultures make differences, but cultures can be used to, in diversity to enhance it, especially when you see win-win. And in order to keep it going, make sure that you have open lines of communication, no surprises, and you work at project management and strategic level. And off you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ivan, for this uh, interview. Let me give it a try again with my fancy slides. Okay, good. Next one, please. The first slide, please, or second. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, welcome and hello, everybody from my side as well. Okay, um, now there is a gap between academia and industry, and and it is it is why it depends a little bit on 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 who we are talking about talking to. The process industry, which to which I'm more most familiar. Uh, the gap is more or less significant, and, and it seems like industry is the faulty party here. The, it increases, it try, tends to increase the gap because uh, industry, process industry, is very, is very cost-centered. They look at the cost, whatever they do in, the, in the, those industries, uh, unfortunately. Then pick the power industry. Uh, well, I forgot to say that this is my subjective opinion about the state of state of the gap, so to speak. So, so don't take this for the final truth. Uh, the power industry, uh, there we have a, a gap which is slightly smaller because uh, uh, the industry in that sector realizes that the grid management under the new circumstances where we have renewable energy sources, that's, uh, that's uh, quite uh, demanding and they need to do to support some research and development in this area. Aerospace, that's, as we heard from Finn Ankersen's presentation, that seems to, to, to be able to present that rather small gap between the academia and the industry. Then there is a special sector, and this is again my opinion. Uh, there are very, quite new areas, uh, branches, out there which uh, recently have, in, uh, have invented feedback control and PID control, for instance, so societal processes and business process management processes. And uh, uh, this industry tries to narrow the gap. They approach the academia by, by, academia by saying that, hey guys, we have invented this kind of thing. Isn't it interesting? But academia says that, no, no, it's not interesting. PID control is old fashioned, it's outdated. We are not interested. So there we can see a potentially wide gap. And we can list, of course, every branch of uh, mining and, 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 and metal industries, etc. cetera. But, but these are just a few examples. And there are my, my subjective opinions. Next slide, please. Uh, if the gap is there, we should do something about it. And uh, 
we know that IFAC has a uh, concept called industrial paper where uh, we try to invite, IFAC tries to invite industries to talk. Maybe we need to use another form of paper, conference paper type, where IFAC researchers, IFAC uh, uh, people are telling industry what we can do for them. Industry attraction paper, so to speak. <clears throat> what we also need to do is, <clears throat> sorry, to develop some value propositions for industry. We need to tell the industry what are the benefits of improving uh, the controls uh, using different methods, uh, advanced methods, less advanced methods, and methods which are not developed yet. Uh, how can we impact the profit accumulation in the industries, quality and competence in the industries? And of course, we need to listen and learn what the industry wants to tell us. And I very much like this uh, uh, comic strip, which I borrowed from, from Sylvia's and, and Alex's presentation that uh, uh, the researchers, I don't know, hopefully you can see this, uh, 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 researchers uh, talk a research language and the industry asks what, how much money will this bring up, bring into us if we do this. I think this is all from my side. Thank you. Thank, thanks a lot, Hans. Uh, thanks to all of you for um, presenting uh, your opinion. And I would like now to start the discussion. Um, so I'm going to ask the first question first to the authors, Sylvia and uh, Alex, and of course, uh, I expect uh, the other panelists also to give their uh, opinion on that. So uh, let me um, start first uh, with, I think, uh, something that uh, Sylvia mentioned uh, uh, during the presentation, is the fact that obviously uh, academic researchers and uh, industrial uh, practitioners have uh, different uh, if not orthogonal sometimes, uh, interest and incentives. Uh, then, so how do you think the framework that you guys propose can, could help reconciling this? Uh, so more concretely, what are the actual changes in the way of working both uh, in academia or in industry that you think uh, could help, uh, uh, could help making them work uh, together, although they don't have the same objectives and they don't have the same incentives. Please go ahead. Alex, you can start. Yeah? I got the first. <laughs> <laughs> no problem, no problem. I think on the, the academia side, as I already argued in my uh, slide, huh, I believe we need more multidisciplinary uh, research. That's, that's basically how I feel also that the framework can contribute. Uh, look at the real problems that we face in industry. That requires a, by nature multidisciplinary approach, in my opinion. Uh, just to give a very practical example, I really like real life and practical examples. If you look at the process industry, we are facing uh, uh, environmental uh, challenges. We need to come up with fundamental new ways of, of uh, having uh, processes, new process uh, routes. Uh, uh, you can only establish that by really taking control into your design into account. If you're designing a new process, don't wait with control at the very end, but just take it into account when uh, the process is being designed. So this early integration of control, I think it's a key topic that also de desires more academic uh, attention. On the industry side, very briefly, I believe that we need more vision-based innovation. That's also argued in our, in our paper. We need other ways of thinking about our problems, not just firefighting, but also thinking a little bit ahead uh, with more advanced uh, technologies. We're always afraid to introduce them because there are risks of uh, safety, health or environment or there are risks of uh, yield reduction or whatever. So really introduce vision-based innovation in the industries. That's basically, and there are some examples of what good look like. Huh? It's not only the example of Finn Ackerson of ESA. I also see it in some of the German process industries going very well. And we need to learn from that. And that's basically what we also would like to argue in the paper. Do the same also for other industry clusters, industry sectors, 
learn from your ways of cooperation that are already have proven to be successful. Please, Sylvia. Thank you, Alex. So, uh, I mean, for my view, go back really to the key word of impact. So, and this is what, uh, what even mentioned about creating a win-win game, right? So it's better for both parties to see that the impact they can have by collaborating can really like step up the game at a, at a much higher level. So like the, the example that, uh, that was sure for aerospace as well, right? I mean, I have two examples of uh, functioning institutions or model uh, that I have experienced personally. So one would be, of course, the one of a large corporation that can afford having a research center, in which case then the research center is like, is this mediator? Is this, uh, I mean, is this entity that can mediate between the two, right? Between the two worlds. So a strong academic collaboration and then business unit that drive, drive their product. So this, this man in the middle, and uh, these were successful because pretty much there were incentives there were incentives to do it. There were incentives for technology transfer. And like in everything, there can be other examples, but incentive will work like uh, it will be with renewable energy, right? So there is a point in which the thing will not fly alone. So there needs to be external uh, incentive to be able to, to move. And then eventually the thing, the cycle will activate itself. So the other example that I have is the University of Applied Science in Switzerland that collaborate with small startups. So spin-offs are a good example in which not many, but one idea can really make it to all the chain. And you will see this is really, the, for a startup to be successful, you need to have a clear, like a clear understanding of what the customer wants, if you're going to make it or not financially, and you need to, to have a really good idea, okay, that we can make this happen. So in that sense, I see startup and an academic, a applied science academic institution as a possible, uh, a possible model. And there are things we can learn from these uh, two models, but pretty much goes back to creating a win-win game and uh, also having a structure and understanding. So having developed this common language, having uh, a, few, a few people or possibly everybody involved that can at least communicate with the next person in the chain, right? And then at least understand the financial impact. So look at the whole picture and see the financial impact and the difficulty that we are going to meet when developing a solution. Uh, finally, one very practical thing that I see is fundamental is the use, I mean, it sounds strange, but is the use of emulators. I mean, the use of emulators allow to develop a solution up to a point in which it can, in principle, be take, taken over from an industry. So to create this continuity in practice would mean that the theoretical solution has to be developed up to a point in which can at least stand the test of an emulator. This would already be a language that it can be then absorbed uh, and taken from industry without having each one to go through the whole step. So this is my my view on the point. Thank you. I leave it to uh, the others. All right, Sylvia. Yeah, I would like to hear the other panelists on this topic on um, how to reconcile uh, two parties with different incentives and interests or maybe not completely different according to the first answers I heard. Well, I could uh, add something, uh, Monsef, um, on, uh, on, on, on that in, in terms of uh, what, uh, what I think is important is uh, uh, if an industry or uh, uh, an agency and so on, uh, want to achieve a certain future uh, uh, objectives to have a, a relatively well worked um, technology development plan uh, which is not going too far in the future because then it just becomes uh, some uh, uh, non-consolidated things but something which is realistic like two to, to four year uh, plan then uh, in, in my experience is then uh, to use that one uh, to have uh, a collaboration on small activities in the beginning uh, together with both industry uh, and uh, academia uh, on uh, using uh, the academy, academia uh, knowledge in, in new things which is maybe not mature at this point in time uh, but then mature it and, and go through a maturation process uh, in the direction of uh, what is the need uh, on the uh, industrial uh, side. 
uh, on top of that, it, it is important also to uh, put seeds in the ground in, in order to uh, get a domain understanding uh, of the uh, problems uh, which are on either side. Uh, so basically to understand where uh, each party is coming from and, uh, and keep in mind that even though that they have different objectives, uh, they can work together on a common language, uh, on a common project uh, with, with a common goal. And then in, in our experience that over a relatively short uh, time, uh, one to two years with those, uh, very useful things are coming out of, uh, you can say, studies or pilot projects, which are then going into later, uh, bigger scale, uh, uh, more industrial, uh, real life uh, problems, taking into account all the uh, typical constraints uh, that uh, that you have in real life. And in the aerospace world, uh, one one uh, which might sound strange in, in general, but it is basically still computational uh, power uh, due to uh, uh, space qualification and radiation issues. Uh, we cannot fly uh, computers that you have in your phone because we are getting lets uh, all the time. Uh, so it is much slower, so you uh, cannot do a real-time optimization as you can on ground. And that is for some academia is a little bit hard to swallow. But uh, that that is actually uh, providing grounds for uh, doing in additional additional research work in order to get these kind of methods into a framework which is implementable and that you can fly. And, and then you can say both, both, both sides are, are winning on it because there is new research being done, which is driven by the real life uh, implementations. So that's just one contribution from my view on, on, on the first question. Thank you, Finn. Um... Is there any comment on this uh, on this first aspect of a reconciliation between the two communities, even our hands? Uh, may I speak, please? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, good. Um, yes, it's um, the gap is there. Yes, and and we need reconciliation, and and there is a kind of chicken and egg, pro egg problem involved here because. Uh, in order to be able to convince the industry that this and this controller algorithm will will help to solve your problem and will earn money to you you need to prove that uh, in some way so would that then mean that you need to build the control solution before you are going to build the control solution so that's a chicken and egg problem um, so what you need to do is to do some kind of approximate solution a, a preliminary solution to the control problem in order to get an estimate of the benefits to the industry that this control system or algorithm will, will bring in uh, when implemented. So this is, of course, how you solve it. Uh, Sylvia mentioned an interesting word, an emulator. And what I think, as I understood that, that you actually mean some kind of test bench to, to, to prove or to demonstrate that this control system or algorithm will work for this particular problem. Of course, you cannot uh, build it in, in very deep detail, but, but to some certain extent, you, you can build it. For instance, for you have in the process industry, industries and everywhere else, you have a dynamic system with dynamics. You can build an is, initial steady state version that with a, uh, uh, enough of accuracy then demonstrates that, that, that this will bring in some benefits in this particular case by implementing control. Yes, and Thank you. The idea, the, exactly having hardware in the loop emulators, because this would be the standard tool that an industry will use to validate any solution even that they develop. So in that case, it's really something that can run enough tests on realistic scenario. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. If there is no other comment on this first point, I would like to, to, to ask you another question, maybe again start with the authors, but this time I about... Even, uh, we want to see even, right, as well. It's fine. <laughs> I didn't think oh, it, given sorry. time, go ahead with the next question. Okay, <laughs> sorry fine. about that. I didn't see you raise no, no, your hand. It's okay, it's okay. 
Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, this this time I want to hear uh, your opinion about the genericity. So in the paper, uh, you propose uh, to tackle the problem by collecting requirements and then uh, per industry sector. And I think you gave uh, an example uh, on the traction power converter, but for the audience, it would be interested to comment on how generic is this approach. If I'm looking for another industry uh, sector, do you think uh, it, it would work or do we come up with results that are completely obvious? Uh, so please go ahead if you have any comments on that. Yeah, it would be interesting actually to listen to the audience on that uh, point of view, yes. Because it's, yeah. yes. Or the other panelists as well. I mean, I would maybe exactly. talk to the other panelists. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Perhaps we yeah. see this, this picture as like Generic. a guideline to look at the big picture. Okay. But uh, yeah, it would be interesting from the other panelists to see, I mean, based yeah. on the experience that Alex and I have. So it will be then in the process industry and in the power conversion industry for me. But So uh, any opinion on how to use this approach of collecting um, um, creating a list of uh, requirements per industry cluster on other on other aspects, like maybe, I don't know, agriculture or aerospace, or uh, is this approach feasible? Did you experiment it? How do you tackle it? If I may, I think it's a little bit more involved in a way, and I suspect that the picture conveys this idea already. It's very rarely that you have a well-defined industrial problem because it was well-defined and probably the industry could have solved it already. So normally it's a little bit less well-defined. And you need iterations in this process. How can I approach it? And the other thing that you've heard from all the panelists is multidisciplinary. Control plays a part. And it's understanding what that part is and bringing the right parties together. Because if it's all control, you're probably not solving the real problem. And if it's no control, you're also probably not solving the real problem. So bringing the right parties together uh, and allowing this process to iterate. You start with something that's probably the key problem, work through it, find out how to go forward, then add to it what you were missing in the first instance, go back and forth. And I think it, the, the back and forth, the nonlinear nature of this approach of innovation is extremely important. Uh, it, it's, it's a bit like two steps forward, one step backwards, and it's all the time that way. And I, 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 it, the picture is maybe a little bit too nice that it's like a circle, but it is a lot of feedback with a lot of iterations and a lot of intermediate feedback. That's what I meant by the communication. It's really important. You hit your head against the wall, then that's not the end of the story, but everybody needs to know why it's a wall and how then, what is the next, how do you get around it? So that communication thing is important. But yeah, it is a start, it's a good picture to start with. As long as we remember that it's not uh, totally nice linear process in the circle, there's a lot of back and forth and iterations in there, then it's a good place to start. But it has to be something in for both parties. And I think that the picture brings it out very nicely. This can only work when it's really win-win. So that, I think that is nice in that picture. There, there is actually a very nice question that we have ducked so far is, uh, we haven't used the dirty word of IP. Uh, I suspect we all have our scars and on our back of what IP looks like. And uh, it, it's a complicated environment uh, in academia as well as in industry to talk about intellectual property. But honestly, if, if we put the lawyers in the right spot and we ask ourselves, why are we actually doing this? Then IP is never the most important question. And that's really what we should start striving for. Um, universities that want to own all the IP, I think that is silly because the problem is always coming from elsewhere as well. So you can't have all the IP on your side. Industry owning everything is also not possible. Why do you collaborate? If you collaborate, the team has a full grant IP where all parties have contributed to. So there is a middle ground and people have to find it. And that's why the champions are important. If, if you need to break a barrier, that's one barrier that the champions can break for you, but you do need these people to help you in that space. Very good, thanks a lot, uh, Ivan. Um, so um, I have plenty of other questions <laughs> and uh, uh, but we will not have the time uh, to to tackle everything today. And uh, I was thinking while uh, hearing you that maybe we can continue the discussion 
maybe with the, the same panel in our uh, next uh, uh, event. Um, so, because I would like to to take some minutes to answer um, the the questions from uh, the audience. Uh, so it's not too frustrating for them. And I have already one question for all of you in the panel. So we talked about academia, we talked about industry players, but we didn't mention the research technology organizations. And I think it's very important that to hear from you, how do you see the role, that's the question from the audience, of such organization like Fraunhofer in Germany, Catapult, uh, Carno Center of Rise in Sweden, uh, in helping the, uh, to bridge the gap between these uh, two parties that are academia and industry. Do you have any experience? What is your opinion on that? Yeah, I, I believe. Can, uh, sorry, go ahead, Alex. Yeah, I briefly referred also to uh, uh, the German way of cooperation, uh, where this, uh, these industry and uh, research and technology organizations play a very important role, uh, like you mentioned here in your question, Fraunhofer in Germany, uh, but also uh, ZVEI and uh, Namur. Uh, and I think that's, that's also the key. But of course, it has limitations because it's mostly uh, a, a, a national activity, a, a local activity. Whereas the problems that we face, for instance, in process industry, well, they don't end up at uh, the borders of our country. But at least it's a help on, on a local scale to get the discussion going and to organize really also what I also recommended, uh, these, these kind of brokerage events where industry and academia come together. I think they play a, play a key role. But the problems that we face don't end up at, at the border. Please, Finn. Yes, I, 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 yes I, would, I fully agree with you. Uh, our experience, we work together with all these institutes uh, every day. And, and, and we have very good benefits from them. Uh, we also have our own uh, business incubator uh, for... Uh, transferring of technology both as a spin out but also as a spin in from uh, other industries uh, to aerospace and from aerospace uh, to for example we have done uh, the rendezvous and docking missions to the space station and some of that camera based uh, navigation technology there suddenly became an interest for a car manufacturer in Portugal uh, where we actually had a collaboration with them and that improved their capability to their assembly line to uh, autonomously assemble uh, dashboards, windscreens and things like that, which is based on uh, what we developed for docking to the space stations uh, autonomously. Uh, plus, there is uh, very often uh, some small amount of seed money and funding available uh, for starting, I would say, what some people call a little bit the crazy ideas, which doesn't have a goal right now, but sometimes it is useful to, to start those. So yes, I think uh, they have a, a very good role to play. Yeah, uh, may I please speak up about these uh, organizations and, and uh, research organizations and others which do funding of, of projects different projects. I have been talking about these value propositions in my introductory speak and, and uh, uh, with regards to those value propositions, we, they are different for, for these organizations for sure because uh, an industry enterprise might have uh, five, six important projects they are looking at but an organization has 100 or 200 or 500 projects they are looking at. So for sure the value proposition that IFAC brings out will be different for, for these organizations. So in all, IFAC needs a set of value propositions for different purposes, maybe even for different uh, industry types, uh, different one for the power industry, different one for process industry, different one for the organizations. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we only have a few minutes uh, before we need to to close this first uh, webinar. Uh, so uh, I think I'm going to stop here and don't take any more questions because I don't think we'll have the time uh, to answer uh, them. Uh, 
Uh, as I just mentioned, uh, I still have a long list of questions and the audience as well. Uh, so I want to tell the audience that uh, uh, we they're going to receive invitation for the next webinar. We didn't yet decide on the date, but it should be approximately in a two months uh, time uh, interval. And uh, we uh, are considering maybe continuing this discussion because as you have noticed, there are a, a lot of points uh, we didn't touch. Uh, free for, uh, if you are interested, uh, I'm talking to the audience here, not the panelists, in joining uh, the, the panel like our brave uh, uh, people did today, uh, please contact me. We are always uh, looking for interesting opinions. And I saw a lot of opinions from you uh, in the, the the chat window. So I assume a lot of you have a lot to say about this important topic on how to bridge the gap between uh, the industrial and the academic uh, control communities. So with that, uh, I would like uh, to close uh, this uh, webinar. Thanks to all of you. Uh, thanks to all the panelists. Uh, uh, I uh, personally uh, learned a lot today with them and I hope you did uh, as well. Uh, let me just remind you uh, that right after uh, this webinar, uh, we're going to have uh, the uh, IFAC Industry uh, Committee uh, meeting. Uh, so you can stay for those of you who wants to attend. Uh, you can stay uh, online to attend uh, to this uh, meeting. Thanks again. Uh, thank you. And uh, hope to see you uh, in a period of two months from now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.